Johnny. Um, I've got to apologise up front. I'm quite often accused of having very dry delivery at the best of times. It's going to get even drier today because my voice is dying on me. So if I sound a little bit flat, again, I apologise. I have hot water down here, which uh, it is genuinely only water. Um, one of the problems I have when I, I talk to groups of people is everybody looks at me and goes, who the hell are Advanced 365? We are, and I will admit to a vested interest here, a cloud provider. Um, and my job uh, sits squarely in advising people on how best to use the cloud and also looking at the security of the cloud. Um, at a wider level, you may have heard of Advanced if you use a product in your business called Laser Forms because we d design, deliver and produce that. So we, we have an interest, we have a business called Advanced Legal. So we, we have an understanding of your sector as well as I think a broader view perhaps of cloud technology, security and elements around that. We also have delivered some goodie bags to your table. Um, as with most goodie bags, there's some very curious things in them. Um, jelly beans, I'm not quite sure how that relates to IT. There is a bottle opener in there, which I'm slightly concerned you might all be reaching for by the end of this. So if I see twitching, I will try and stop and move on. The thing about cloud is every time I mention the word cloud, I usually get a wince off people. It's kind of a inherently an emotional reaction to cloud. I think technology in general is getting a bit more emotional. I see people sitting in pubs arguing the merits of Apple and Android. Maybe I just go to the wrong pubs, I don't know. But it's becoming less of a technical issue. It's becoming quite emotional. And I think that's part of the problem. And one of the things I want to look at today is trying to separate fact, fact from fiction is more about trying to put some fact against the emotion and just seeing if we can come to some conclusions before we <laughs> fall foul of um, all those penalties that were going up there. I think 100 million euros is quite a scary number, so if we could figure out some ways of perhaps avoiding that, that would be quite a good idea. One of the other problems with cloud is it's a marketing term. And I know I have some of our marketing people in the room, so I'm not going to get too rude about it, but it's not helpful because nobody actually really knows what it means. I don't know that necessarily I've got the right answer either but I'm going to give some definitions because I need something to hang my hat on here. And if we can broadly agree to that, just for the purposes of the next 30 minutes or so, then that, that will help me. There's also lots and lots of other terms flying around. There's everything as a service these days. And I think also people just make up terms to suit themselves. I'm going to stick to three very simple definitions. I'm going to look at the public cloud, which is the cloud that's out there that I think is the one that most people find frightening. It's the one everybody goes, it's shared. Oh, God, my data's mixed up with everybody else's. It, it's, I've seen the word, the data is pooled. I'll come back to that later. That's not actually true. Um, what a public cloud is, generally, is an application that shares code. It's the application, it's not the data, and that's the important part about this. The vendors build them because it's an easy and efficient way to sell you the application. They do it for applications, generally, that people use in the same way. Email, for example. We send email, we receive email. There's not a unique way of doing it in most organisations. And if there is, there probably shouldn't be. That's the way they do it. And they do it because it's cheaper and easier to share that. But they will all keep your data separate. And I'll come back to, it, to what happens to the data later. You also have, on the other side, the concept of a private cloud exactly what it says it is. It's one that you use and you own. In fact, you could probably regard your own data centres as private clouds. They could be sitting in somebody else's data centre. You could actually be renting or buying part of that from somebody else as well, but it's yours. You have the ability to change the application that's in there. Now, there was a survey recently. Who, who here's from IT, by the way, and who here isn't? Can, is anybody from IT before I name you and shame you? No, that's good. Right, we can be rude about IT. That's brilliant. They did a survey at Gartner not long ago, and they went to 200 CIOs from enterprise organisations and said, how many cloud applications have you got in your organisation? All the CIOs came back with a response. Gartner then said, can you go out and spend a month just checking that and then come back again? Not all of them did, but out of the ones that did, 60% of them came back and went, ah, there's more than we thought there was. 
And that's part of the problem. See, the thing about a cloud is you can just buy it on a credit card a lot of the time. Even a corporate-wide application, people can go out and buy it. They will buy it from a departmental point of view. One of the great things about the cloud is you don't need the IT department involved anymore. That's how the vendors sell it to you, which is great, except if they don't know it's there, and then again, maybe the compliance department also don't know it's there, we've got a bit of a problem. And that problem is going to get worse because the users coming along, the people who are way younger than I am, are going to sit there and they're going to go, hang on a minute, that's how I buy my IT. I go to an app store, I find what I'm looking for, I download it, I start using it. It's difficult to stop from an IT point of view as well because a lot of them work in the browser. And it's quite difficult to prevent people doing that. Which is good until they start putting data into it. Because the chances are they haven't read the end user license agreement. I mean, let's face it, there's an interesting sector here to ask this question of, when you get that end user license agreement pop up when you install an application, who here genuinely, honestly reads it every time? Nobody. And we expect the users to. Doesn't happen. So a lot of the time they don't actually know where the data's going. So there's, there's, there's kind of a, uh, an inherent problem in, in how we're thinking and where the cloud is driving us, which is going to start to sound like maybe the cloud isn't such a good idea. The other problem is we've now got this concept of hybrid cloud that's ar arisen. And everybody goes, well, hang on, where's, where, what's the difference between public, private, and hybrid? Where, where does the data go in hybrid? Well, the answer is it doesn't. The hybrid cloud isn't actually a cloud. It's probably the thing we need to focus on the most, though, because it's actually where you start to join the other two together. It's where you put the control mechanisms. It's where you put the things that you monitor, where you check the compliance, where you see what's happening in the other systems. It's also the least uptaken, if that's a word, it is now, um, solution that's out there, because a lot of people are, are allowing the clouds to spawn a little bit, thinking it's control, but they're not putting an overarching control across the top of it. I think, and I'm not having a, <coughs> as soon as I saw the last presentation, I thought maybe I should take this slide out, but actually <laughs> not, because there is an awful lot of regulation. Because it's an emotive reaction, I actually think a lot of the regulation has become quite an emotional reaction as well. And the uh, trialogue, for instance, um, that is becoming quite emotional by the sound of it. I mean, the last person I spoke to said, December, you're you, great, but don't put a year on it by the time they've all beaten each other up. And there is an awful lot going on out there, and it's very difficult to work out what complies with what. That's also a problem from the cloud provider's point of view, because they've got to sit there and try and work this out themselves and make sure they can deliver something to you that complies with what you need them to comply with and all the emotion that goes around it. And it is just, quite frankly, confusing. So I'm going to stand by this statement for now, because I just think we have so many regulations that we're trying to stick with, that we're, not, we're actually going to go round and round in circles and lose ourselves, and we're going to not do things that are quite positive. Because don't get me wrong, having sat here and said the cloud is not a good thing in all of those respects, actually it's the future. And whether or not we like it, it's here. And I think that's going to change even more because people are going to drive it as much as anything else. Now, I'm not here to have a dig at anybody but I'm going to raise some questions, and this is where this emotive component comes in. I found an interesting statement from the SRA on cloud computing, and I got quite bothered by it. The word that particularly bothers me in there is surrendering. Because to me, that sounds like I've given up. It, you have it. You're the cloud provider. You, you deal with everything. You're surrendering true control of your data. It just isn't true in the cloud. But when you see a statement like that coming out from a regulatory body, and I'm sorry if there's anybody else in the, from the SRA in here, and you can come and slap me around the face later, but I think the problem here is it's going to create an emotional reaction to it. It's also inaccurate in that it says data is pooled. It's not. If you take one of the simple examples that's out there, Microsoft Office 365, your email system. If you take this as a statement, it says the data is pooled. That means your data somehow is mashed up with everybody else's. My email sits next to your email, sits next to your email, and we can't separate them. 
that is not true. In fact, if you want to, you can go to Microsoft and you can say, not only do I want it in a particular place, I want it on that server. And they'll go, yeah, that's not a problem. So it's, when we have statements like that going around, we get a reaction to it. We sit there and we go, hang on a minute, public cloud, that's bad. We mustn't do it. And that's going to actually prevent progress in many respects. Because we are going towards cloud. If we don't do it constructively, there's going to be a mad rush at the end. And suddenly, people <coughs> don't have any choice in many respects. And we're not going to get there in a constru constructive, measured way. I was also, um, no, too close. The, the flip side of that is how they define private cloud. And it says everything is separated. Well, that's not true either. Because if you actually go back, even if your private cloud is a data center in your offices, you'll find that actually not everything is in separate areas in the way that that implies compared to the previous statements. And these are subsequent paragraphs in their, recommend in their observations document. So the implication there is that somehow these are completely separate. They're not. Because you share data with your clients to start with, so they can't be entirely separate. And I think, rather, I'm not having a go at the SRA here. I'm not, I'm not trying to mock everything that's been done. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put a context around this and say what you're seeing is some emotional reaction here and, quite frankly, some inaccurate statements that we are then basing our decisions on. And that's going to be troublesome. And what that leads us to is, is uh, one that I hear quite often, again, in the strange pubs that I sit in, which is you should never put sensitive data into the cloud. And I think that was one of the observations earlier, which was we, you, you can take a view on what's, if you like, sensitive and non-sensitive data and where it goes and how it goes. You can, to a degree, regard the fact that the cloud is inherently in the middle your data is as separate, and I'll show you in a minute how I believe it's as secure as anywhere else. I think you should genuinely admit, if you take the view that only non-sensitive data should be stored in the cloud, it becomes a very small amount in most organisations, because if you've got a whole bunch of non-sensitive data, my first question is not which cloud are you going to put it in, but why have you got it? You know, it's, it becomes just almost background noise in many respects. So I think this becomes important to, take, to understand that actually it is safe. It can be safe up there. There is the inevitable question about where is it? And there is this, again, the whole safe ar harbour argument. And I'm, I'm actually really glad I followed you because this is brilliant. Save me um, having to explain too much of this. We do need to know where it is. We do need to take an understanding of it. But the point is, it has changed a lot and the GDPR will change a lot as well. But the cloud providers know this. They're not daft. They do understand that you need to know where your data is, and they will guarantee that you can have it where you want it. Microsoft and Amazon, both in the last six weeks, have announced they're going to build data in England. They've been very precise about that. Being their big American companies, I'm not sure that Glasgow counts as England, but anyway, <laughs> by the by, <laughs> it's near enough. Unless I've just upset a whole bunch of Scottish nationalists as well. Um, but they are actually addressing this, and you can go to any cloud provider and you can say, I want my data there, I do not want it anywhere else, you must not replicate it. And they will do that. Whoever they are, even Microsoft and Amazons of the world, will guarantee that if you want them to. Excuse me a second. My humour's going to get very dry in a minute, this room. So the reality is we can control where our data goes. And we can negotiate with those providers to make sure. There is another problem, though, because a lot of this has been about where does it go, how does it, how may it move around, where's the compliance. But there are some people out there. Oh, sorry, there's another myth there. There are some people out there who uh, essentially aren't very nice. Let's face it. They want your data. They want your information. But you've got to be very aware that there's different kinds of people out there. And they attack for different reasons. So you get the script kiddies. Talk, talk. I freaked a lot of people out. The 17, uh, depends on which paper you read, the 16-year-old or the 17-year-old. Hacked, talk, talk. 
I think the ironic thing about that is the hack he used is a known flaw in a database that's older than he is. <laughs> Scarily, the patch to fix the flaw is also older than he is. And TalkTalk Talk said he must have been really clever. I just think he read a lot of old books. They are the least, in some respects, concerning because of the way they go about it. They don't actually know what they're doing. They, they will just go for flawed systems. And if you keep your systems basically patched, basically secure, and somewhere locked up, the chances are pretty good the script kiddies will go away. So they're less, less of a problem as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> However, these other four groups are more, in, are more interesting and more concerning. So hacktivists do it for moral reasons, allegedly. I think quite often it's moral reasons with a bit of financial benefit. People inside. Now the problem with insiders is some of it's deliberate, quite a lot of it isn't. And that's, we have to deal with that in different ways. With all the as a services, I decided crime as a service was quite a good idea. So <laughs> I've now got the concept of CAS. They are the people basically who will do it for money and they will take their time, and it is a billion pound industry. And the state-sponsored. So I want to hear less about. The state-sponsored one, though, does, um, has an interesting profile. Sony is probably the classic example of state-sponsored attacking. When they uh, were taken down by a state who denied it, so I'm not going to mention it. The problem there was they just deleted all their data, and their backups, and their copies, and their compliance copies. They didn't take anything, they didn't steal anything, they just deleted it. And it's one of the things we don't always think about when we're looking at security. A lot of it's about loss, it's about leakage, it's about how people are going to use it. What would you actually do if somebody came in and deleted all your data? What would be more damaging in some respects? I mean, okay, 100 million euros is a lot of money, but actually a lot of people can carry on trading in that respect, and, you know, that is a cap. But if you haven't got that data anymore and you have no way of reconstructing it because they've been very good, you've got a real problem. So what we're seeing here is we are seeing some very organised, very efficient. You can almost regard them as businesses, these, these four categories here. This is their business. Their business is attacking your data. Now, irrespective of where it is, we've got to be careful. Now, the good news is, those nice gentlemen down at GCHQ have done quite a, a lot of profiling on how these groups work. And there is a definite attack profile in how people come after you. The, 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 the script kid is almost goes straight to the end with actions and then kind of work back. You know, typical teenagers. It's don't go through the process to get there. What happens, though, with, with a lot of the other organisations is they spend a lot of time in reconnaissance. And that reconnaissance can be physical. It can be literally following you round. I sat on the train, a regular commute train that I go on, and he didn't have a lot of briefcase, this bloke, because he had all his barrister's papers spread out in front of him, along with his notes. I don't know if I should say this in a room like this. I'm an ex-accountant, so I'm an auditor, so I learned to read upside down at a very early age. It's quite interesting, the case. Good thing I'm not a bad guy at the end of it all. But they will do that. They will look you up on LinkedIn. They will look you up on Facebook. They will find out about you. Because they're going to target you. That's what these guys are doing. They're targeting. Whereas the script kid is a kind of, this, they're going after anybody that's there. And as long as you're aware in that reconnaissance development before they get to the delivery phase, then we've got a chance. Because we have got some responses. And the key ones are detect and deny down there. We need to spot these patterns, or we need to prevent them from happening in the first place. Now, one of the simple ones is, you take a photo on your phone and you stick it on Facebook, and you take a photo of your house or your garden, because you're proud of it and you put it up there. What else goes up with it as soon as you put that photo up? GPS. GPS of where that photo was taken. Doesn't take a lot of correlation to work out that's who you are, that's your picture, and that's where you live. So they've got some information already, and this is exactly what they go out and do. 
We just need to get an awareness of it. So ultimately, what we can... Oh, I've just gone backwards, sorry. <laughs> we'll respond again. That what we can do is we can try and get the defender's advantage here. We need to push to the left. It's left on yours as well. The left of the attack phases. We need to be able to get in there and detect and deny early so that actually we don't have to deal with the consequences. See, a lot of people come to me doing what I do and they say, well, you know, I want to buy systems that will respond to threats and, and to know how to deal with them. And yes, you need a response policy. What you don't need to do is look like Dido Harding did after Talk Talk had been hacked, when she stood up there and clearly hadn't got a clue what was going on. What we need to do, though, is we need to push it to the front. Because those things are useful, but actually they only tell you that something has gone wrong. And I don't think that's particularly the most useful part of it. But it gets worse, having depressed you so far. What do people attack? That's the question. Where do we as compliance people need to look? Where do we need to take the evasive action? Well, there's the data centre, the cloud, the bit that everybody gets really worried about which is usually a fortress surrounded by biometric locks, security guards, if you can find it, with sufficient backup power alarm system and everything else, you're never going to get anywhere near it. We need to worry about it. We need to ask the questions about where is it, where's the data. We need to make sure legally we're compliant on that. But actually, in terms of protecting it, in the cloud, there is a degree of certainty it will be safe. The cloud providers now are probably one of the most reputationally aware businesses. They lose a little bit of data. They're the people behind the data loss. They are going to struggle. So you're actually buying reputation, not necessarily on technology. Do you know what? Amazon, Microsoft, they do the same thing. Look at the reputation, look at the location, look at the other stuff. Don't look at the technology. People do attack the data centre. It is mainly the people like the script kiddies who go after that. Because a lot of the other guys, one of their stops will be the office, where your users are. And yes, you can encrypt the stuff that's on the devices that's out there. But here's a question. If you've got physical security in your building, how many of your systems can you guarantee that you can stop somebody getting in? Somebody maybe spoofing somebody else, or maybe just talking their way in. Your IT departments will probably do penetration tests. They'll have some hackers out there, strange people. We've got some in our business. We keep them in a room and kind of slide pizza under the door from time to time. But what they do is they ethically hack. They try and get into businesses. What's more interesting, though, is sending people into businesses. There's a big bank in London that I know that one of our staff walks into every two months and plugs his laptop into their local area network. But they have a massive security system, but they don't test it. They don't test it in the context of that's where data loss comes from. It needs to be part of your IT security to actually test whether or not people can get into your building. Because that is quite a large attack surface. The other one is remote working on an approved device. So again, going back to uh, the comment earlier about you can encrypt everything that's on the device, as you can if you own the device. So if it's a device that's been provided by your IT department, by your company, it probably has got some encryption on it. Thing is, you've also got to be aware that what it's talking across has got encryption on it. There's a little card knocking around here. Who's used this to actually hook on? Who checked whether or not it was encrypted first? Because it's actually only got a password on it. So I could just sit there and sniff the data off the wire. I'm not having a go at the venue. Most are like that, because it's virtually impossible to secure it back. It's not impossible, but just it's about thinking about it. It's getting worse, though, because people now want to work anywhere on anything they want. Yeah. There's a whole concept to bring your own device to work, which is, yeah, you've bought that one in the IT department, looked at it, done the suitable things. Actually, a lot of people just want to be able to work on what they want to be able to work on. And that's just going to get more prevalent, because Dare I say it, the youth of today, that's the way they think. They want to be able to do this. 
So we've got a problem. And I say we collectively, because all of us now kind of expect to work anywhere, anytime. Which gives us, A, a huge attack surface, but turning it around the other way, that becomes a huge compliance service. It's starting to get to the point where we don't know if we're coming or going. So, I think it's a myth that the majority of efforts should be expended on where the data is. And that's what people have traditionally done. The cloud has always been about, hang on, Microsoft have got my data, I need to do lots of things to make sure it's secure. There is an element, a genuine element in there that you can trust them. <coughs> Did I just put trust and Microsoft in the same sentence? Anyway, yes, you can. However, it's the people outside of that and some of the stuff outside of that that can be the problem. And we need to expend some of the effort in there. I think this is possibly the most telling part of it at all. And by amateurs, you can read script kiddies in there, the professionals or all the other groups. And interestingly, when he said that, he said it very carefully. Amateurs attack machines. They go for it. It's a bit like being caught in the crossfire if one of your systems goes down there. As long as you've got some reasonable protection around you, you will be safe. Professionals target people. And they look for people they think have something they want. And I hate to say it, but law firms are a really good example of what people might want. The other problem is that already over 50% of data breaches are caused by the end users. And by 2020, we're at 95% of it will be caused by the end users because that bit in the middle will be even more secure than it is now. So we've got a, a pattern going on here, if you like. And if we just go back to the how do we attack for a minute, when they target people, it's this piece that's important, it's the reconnaissance. And that's where we need to try and make users aware of what might be going on. And then, what we can do is we can plan our response phases and try and get the detect and deny working better. So effectively what I've done here is I've picked it all up and I've dumped it on the users. That works, doesn't it? Because we all do that. Because at the end of the day, compliance does start with the people. We have a real bad habit though in IT. And we sit there and we castigate the users. We send out lists of the people who've done the naughtiest things. We always point to them and go, this is your problem. You've done this wrong. You haven't got the right passwords. You didn't think about it. The problem is, we can't expect them to do this. It's not helpful. And what we've got to do is we've got to try and find a way of transferring this. You see, Psychologists are very clear on this, and this is a statement of the blindingly obvious in many respects. I'm a security guy, I've got a view on security. There's a lawyer, he's got a view on the law, but his view on security is not the same as mine. And if I give him a million things to do that take up 30 billable hours a week, they ain't going to happen. At a very pragmatic level, it's not going to happen. But there's also a concept of a compliance budget. So behavioural psychologists have looked at this, and it's not just about IT, this is actually all aspects of life. But users have a compliance budget. They have a certain amount of effort they can instinctively spend on thinking about compliance, and particularly about IT and security compliance. If they go over that, if they exhaust that budget they have in their minds, they'll find coping strategies to go with it. The trouble is, those coping strategies are usually about trying to avoid some of those processes that are in place. And what happens is the <coughs> security officer, the IT department, they go and they yell at them. But actually, we can't do that. We need therapy rather than we need berating at this point. So what we need to do is we kind of need to change IT into psychologists. Interesting. Let me ask a uh, quick question. If anybody here was to look at the service desk, or just look at yourselves, so this question was kind of written, I think it was from IT in, in mind. Most service desks, the request to reset passwords because they've been forgotten, are usually way up there. Because people just can't deal with it. It becomes 
a huge problem. And then they say you've got to be complex and original and it can't relate to you. And have you ever tried thinking of those? These all look really good until you actually read them quite closely. They are all compliant, complex passwords. They're all in the hacker's dictionary as well. They'll get striped straight, straight away. So it's not actually helping when we say that. Complexity isn't the king. If we enforce these high complexity passwords, users will just use the same one a lot of the time. Unfortunately, it will quite often be the same one they use for Facebook or LinkedIn. And do you know what? They're not actually that difficult to get hold of, dare I say it. If you repeat them, we've got a problem. Or they'll pick obvious ones. <coughs> <coughs> Let's face it, we all do it. Or they'll just use minor variations. I'll stick a one at the end or a two at the end. So you've only got to get one. We need to be aware of their budget and we need to spend it where it's the most effective. And we need to be very cognizant that the user is trying, but they have a day job. And actually, a billable day job by the hour, which is even more important in some respects. It's about recognizing that. So having now said, OK, the biggest problem with the cloud is the problem is the user. I'm now saying we've got to be nice to the user. Kind of digging myself a hole in some respects here. But there, there is a logic to where I'm going. But here's the, here's the other question. And this one I'd genuinely like a show of hands on. When there was last a security breach in your company from an IT systems perspective, were HR in the room for the review? Why not? Given that it's actually probably caused by a user, we don't engage HR in the security review. We don't look at the person and go, yeah, you've made a mistake. How can we help you address that? We don't give them counselling, for want of a better word. It's an important hole, I think, in the, the way the whole thing works. It's about understanding that profile of the users and trying to address it the right way and get the right people involved. So what we need to look at is how we create a program that will, will enable the users, because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to enable them rather than beat them over the head, but we're also trying to protect our information. But, and here's the problem, how do we work out the budget for it? How do you work out, or have you worked out, the value of the information in your company, your firm? Now, 100 million euros is a good starting point. Probably not enough in most cases. Turn it around another way. Think about it. Go back to Sony for a minute. If your firm lost 25% of its data, somebody came in and they went delete. Then they deleted the backup. Then they deleted the DR copy. Then they deleted the compliance copy. What would that cost your firm? Who here's done that maths? <coughs> Who's got a value on their data? So how have you got a budget <coughs> for security? Because that, if you like, is the top line. If you can't work that out, the rest of it you're going to struggle with, I think. You could kind of take a generic view like this. I can tell you as an ex-finance director, if somebody came to me and said, that's my budget for compliance, I wouldn't take it very seriously. I want numbers. I want to know what we're going to spend it on, and I want to know what the return on the investment is. Because we're going to have to do some changing here. And if this was another kind of project in the business, that budget would be available. But it, for some reason, it's not in a lot of cases. Because the biggest thing we need to think about here is how we're going to make these changes. Now, bizarrely, as the IT guy in the room, it's not an IT project. It can't be. It's a fundamental change project across the firm. It's got to apply everywhere. Now, if it's that fundamental, we can't do it without a budget. If we haven't got a value, we haven't got a budget. So we need to do that first of all. Now, how we do change I'm sure there have been different changes in your firms. You've, you may have used different approaches. I'm going to use one that I know and use um, and have shamelessly stolen from somebody else. But um, John Cotter came up with an eight-stage change model a long time ago. And it's all about, at the bottom, working up. 
It's about creating some urgency, but more importantly, gaining sponsorship. It's about the partnership understanding the nature of the problem. But the partners are not IT guys. So the only way you're going to get this through is to try and get to the value of what happens if we don't do this. And then you've got to be able to share it and communicate it. Now, any one of these change programs can go horribly, horribly wrong at any stage. So I'm going to be really positive here and assume that at least some of the first ones have gone right. However, if you look at communication, under-communicating is usually caused because it's given to IT. Dare I say, as the IT person in the room, they're not the world's best communicators. They're not very good at putting it in a context that everybody understands. In fact, they irritate the hell out of people most of the time. If it comes out of IT, it's not going to work. And that's the biggest problem. The other thing is, to be able to enable it, you've got to have a budget. And if we haven't done the data evaluation in the first place, we haven't got a budget. So it doesn't matter actually how bad they communicate at this point because we can't get to the next step anyway. Which is why it needs to go back into the organisation because only the organisation can value the data. Only, only your partners, only your guy, you guys understand the value of that data to understand the budget to be able to communicate it. I've got a very dangerous statement to make now, um, given the nature of the room. I may leave immediately after this statement, but compliance is not enough. Because too much of compliance, particularly in IT security, particularly if it's run by the IT department, is about ticking boxes. And that doesn't work. This is about anchoring it into the firm's culture, putting it in people's heads that they need to just think. Has anybody here come across spear phishing? Has anybody been a victim of it? Why did they not succeed? <laughs> it's interesting. So spear phishing is the notion that you get an email from somebody who is perhaps your boss asking you to do something and they know who you are and it's your email address and it's from your boss's email address and you know what a lot of people just do it and one of the favorite ones is goes into a finance clerk from the finance director will you please put ten thousand pounds in that bank account so they do it trouble is you can't get that ten thousand pound back because the bank will sit there and go well that's a legitimate transfer sorry <coughs> you can't really have a go at the clerk for doing what their boss tells them there's a problem if you educate people a more about what's going on, you'll get the uh, response I got from talking to somebody here yesterday who said, actually, yes, I got a, an email like that from my managing partner who told me very nicely exactly what he wanted me to do. I'm like, okay, did you do it? He said, no, the, the, the upside was he asked me nicely and my managing partner never asks nicely, so I knew it wasn't from him. It's actually the tone of how it was written that matters. But again, just making people aware of this, creating an education program around it. I've seen lots of IT security education programs. I saw one given by a hacker not long ago. Didn't understand a word of it. But it was, yeah, seemed quite good. I've seen them given by the IT departments as well. And I go back to kind of my contention that perhaps IT aren't the best communicators in the world. I think it's about getting the right people to do it in the right way. <coughs> and creating a, a slightly wider picture. I still think HR are the best people to do this in most places. Five minutes. They are the learning and development guys. They're the people who can put this message out there. IT can support it with some technology, but actually this is about creating awareness and change inside an organisation. And we've got to get it into business as usual. It's got to ingrain in there. Because if we can do that bit, the cloud suddenly becomes a realistic proposition because we've actually gone down to where a lot of the issues emerge from. So, in my five minutes. One of the things here is, is this is actually a quite a big process of change. Advanced have helped a few people on this journey. Now, I don't like ever describing myself as a consultant because I think... Consultants have a image, an image, of they walk in, 
They ask you lots of questions about your business. They then broadly tell you exactly what you knew to start with, with a little bit more on the bottom. They give you a huge report like that and they go off, which is absolutely no use to anybody. I call them politely white collar consultants. Um, I don't think they are actually of that much value to an organization. Advanced, I would describe as a blue collar consultancy. So yes, we can do some of that first part, but we actually like to assist people going through the journey. Not do it for you, don't think that adds any value at all. It's about trying to engage the right people and trying to broker some of the language. And we do it with three kind of boxed up offerings. We, we have some security awareness training that we can effectively give or sell to your HR department. Yeah, give's the wrong word. Give to your HR department that they can start to recycle in so they don't have to invent that wheel. So we start to inject those processes. We can actually go through and help have a look at the IT and see how security is and start to inject some of the other components in there because there is a conversation to be had. I must guarantee if you go back today and say to your IT department, go and speak to HR, the second word is quite likely to be off, depending on your IT people. It's not a natural kind of relationship. They don't like each other most of the time. That's why I've always advocated who creates a new user in an organisation. I've always said it should be HR. You want to see the look on IT people's faces when I say that. There's also a, a, a cloud enablement component to this, which is starting to look then at where you can put these clouds. And also, because we know a lot of the agreements telling you where you can actually get around, not get around, comply with Safe Harbour and the other um, particularly jurisdictional components. And also, we have views on the security of, of these elements. So we can help do that. We can help start you on the right path if you want to do that. Or you can just take this away and, and get on with it. It's a business change activity. That's the important message here. I have now taken up quite a bit of your coffee break, for which I'm sorry. However, if there is some left, we have a table out there. So I think rather than, if I may, if you have questions, can I suggest perhaps you come and have a chat out there rather than do it in the room so I don't deprive everybody of their coffee? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.